All right. Thank y'all for joining. Appreciate y'all taking time out today. Um, so what we're going to discuss is the ABCs of title insurance. So um, I promise to keep this to an hour. I do tend to be a little long-winded and kind of nerd out on um, subjects like these, but I promise to keep it to an hour. So, um, and I'll try not to bore y'all too, too much. Um, so as you know, I am your um, closer here at Momentous Title. There's my information, um, if y'all don't already have it. Um, and let's see, we'll move on. So the first, the first question is, what is title insurance and who does it protect? So title insurance protects you or the owner from claims of ownership by other parties. It protects against losses from problems that arise before the property is purchased. So the title company will defend you in court if there is a claim against the property and will pay for covered losses. Um, title insurance is not homeowner's insurance. Title insurance is different from other types of insurance that you have. Um, it does not insure against fire, flood, theft, or any type of property damage or loss. Um, it, it does protect against the losses from ownership problems, you know, that arose, you know, prior to you acquiring the property, but were not known at the time that you purchased the property. Um, the owner's policy protects the owners of the property. So title insurance can protect you if someone later sues and says they have a claim against the home from before you purchased it. Common claims come from a previous owner's failure to pay taxes or from contractors who say they were not paid for work done on the home before you purchased it. If a loan is involved in the purchase of the property, a loan policy is also required. Typically the buyer pays for the lender's policy and it piggybacks on a primary policy um, at a fraction of the cost. Um, and basically what that means is when you when you purchase a property, you pay for the owner's title policy, but if you're getting a loan, then that's what we call entitled a simultaneous issue. And um, so the lender's policy is only a hundred dollars. It's a flat fee. Now, of course, if the lender requires additional endorsements, um, which nine times out of 10, they typically do, um, you know, those will be at the expense of the buyer, of course. So um, if at any time anyone has a question, please feel free to um, speak up and interrupt me. I welcome any and all questions. Okay, so what is the difference between a title commitment and a title policy? So the title commitment comes before the closing. The title policy is issued after the closing. So the commitment uh, says that a title company is willing to issue title insurance under certain conditions and if the seller fixes or corrects certain problems. So the policy will then provide coverage for the, for the property they're purchasing. So um, the title commitment uh, lists any potential issues, exclusions, um, or exceptions. So it alerts the buyers to issues that currently exist or could cause problems in the future. It does not guarantee that there are no current issues or that none will arise in the future. Okay, so this is kind of a little summary of what each section uh, of the commitment is, and then we'll start reviewing. I have examples um, of the commitments. So basically, as you all know, the commitment is organized into schedules. So Schedule A, facts about the current state of title and proposed transaction. Schedule B shows items encumbering the property and exceptions that will not be covered by the policy. Schedule C 
uh, items that need to be released or satisfied in order to transfer clear title to the new owner. Um, and Schedule D, uh, regulatory disclosures that the title company and underwriter must make to all parties. So next slide is, so this is a jacket. Typically, um, every single commitment you receive is going to have a jacket by the underwriter. So for momentous title, we're underwritten by Stewart Title and TRG. So whichever one um, is underwriting that particular property, that's the jacket that you will see. Um, so it just shows the standard information. Um, and then I'm an authorized signatory for momentous title. So y'all will see this at the beginning of every commitment. So um, back to Schedule A. So here is an example of Schedule A. Um, the, the, the main things that you'll want to uh, look for from your end um, are a few things. So in this particular one, the vesting is always important. So um, you'll want to make sure that, you know, if you're representing the seller, that their names are listed here. Um, or if you're representing the buyer, you want to make sure that the vesting name matches the, the folks listed uh, as the sellers on the commitment, of course. Um, if you're representing the buyers as well, um, they will be listed as the proposed insured here. Um, if they have a loan, then their loan amount will be listed under the loan policy amount. Um, keep in mind that in the beginning when the lender sends us their title request, they have a proposed loan amount, and that can change um, you know, throughout the transaction. So don't be alarmed if you get a revised commitment with the revised policy amount, because those do fluctuate a little bit, um, you know, as we get closer to um, the closing date and, you know, balance with the lender and all that fun stuff. So um, in addition to those items, the legal description is always listed in um, Schedule A as well. So you'll just want to you know, this typically matches uh, the vesting need as well. And as you'll see, our commitments are hyperlinked. So when you receive the commitment, you'll be able to click on that and view the actual uh, vesting need. All right, so Schedule B, um, Schedule B are the items that are exceptions from coverage. So, and the most typical ones are, uh, you know, CCNRs, so deed restrictions, covenants, things of that nature. So those will always be referenced here as well. And as you'll see, those items are hyperlinked um, as well. Um, as well as uh, here are some other ones. There are uh, building setback lines, utility easements um, that are referenced here. Um, you'll see uh, letter G in this particular one, all leases, grants, um, reservations of mineral rights and things like that are, are always listed as well. If there's an HOA, uh, typically there is reference to the HOA um, on Schedule B. So, all right, so these are a little backwards. So as an agent, what should you look, look for on Schedule C when you receive the commitment? Um, Schedule C is a very important piece of the commitment. So. When the title search is done, Schedule C will reflect any outstanding items that are recorded in the property records against this specific property. So um, customarily, you'll see mortgages. So as you can see on this one, the owners have a mortgage from 2010. 
um, you know, payable to Southwest funding. Um, and it was executed by, you know, husband and wife. Um, as you'll see underneath, uh, marital status is also uh, one of the requirements. So what we typically do is we'll have um, it in the beginning of the transaction, uh, when we send the title package out, uh, which includes the commitment and a tax certificate, we also send um, a seller's intake form as well as a buyer's intake form. So in this particular case, you know, there's a requirement that we must be furnished with the marital status of the record owner. So, um, and I used this commitment as an example. So um, when I sent the title work out, the seller came back and said, oh, my wife passed away four years ago. So I'm, you know, I'm a widower. Um, um, which the listing agent did not, disclosed to me. And then later I found out the listing agent wasn't aware either. So um, this is um, this would be a good thing to add to your list of questions if you don't already have it added is to, you know, make sure that the sellers are alive and well. And if they're not, then, you know, we need to take the necessary steps um, to get those issues resolved. So um, this particular case, Mrs. Luna did have a will. They have not had it probated yet. So in order to sell this property, one of two things could happen. You can have the will probated, um, which does take several months. But uh, what our underwriters have approved for this particular situation, um, since the property is for sale, is we sent Mr. Luna an airship questionnaire. He completed that, returned it with a copy of the will, as well as a copy of her death certificate. And our underwriter has approved that. And so based off of that, Mrs. Luna's uh, ownership of the property all goes to Mr. Luna. So he is uh, going to be the sole owner of this particular property. Um, if they would have filed her will with the probate court prior to the home going for sale, then in Schedule C, you would have um, you would have seen a reference to the probate records, which our examiners would have requested and pulled uh, and and then you would have heard from me, you know, regarding the estate. Um, so uh, anytime there's, um, you know, deceased people in title, um, we do have to go through some extra steps. Generally, they're pretty, uh, they're pretty easy to resolve with an airship affidavit um, if there is no will or if the will has not been probated. Um, in addition to those items, we, um, you may find mechanics liens or second mortgages, or um, I've seen uh, liens on here for water filtration systems. I've seen liens on here for solar panels. And as many of y'all know, lots of folks have solar panels here in North Texas. So um, if you see those, uh, basically what we would do is get a payoff for the solar panel or if it's a lease, uh, we would need the solar panel information. Um, so that way we can obtain the transfer documents and get those items transferred. Um, if it's a water, if it's a water filtration system, then that would need to be paid. Basically everything on Schedule C will need to be satisfied, uh, whether it's a transfer of the solar panel, um, or, or it must be satisfied and paid out of the seller's proceeds at closing. Um, there was one particular file um, that a Turtle Creek agent had. It was open at another title company and there was an affidavit of lien filed by a subcontractor um, that was reflected on Schedule C. 
Um, so basically the, the, the sellers had a, a beautiful pool and outdoor kitchen installed. Um, they hired a pretty large pool company here in DFW. I guess one of the subcontractors that they hired had a dispute with them regarding payments. So that subcontractor filed an affidavit of lien and the title company it was opened with, to my understanding, basically punted it back to the sellers and said, well, you need to go to court and uh, file for a bond and, you know, basically, you know, told the agent, we can't help. So we went to our underwriter, actually, in this particular case, we went to Stewart. Um, and because the affidavit of lien was filed before a certain date, um, it was null and void um, per a certain you know, property law, Texas property law. Um, so to keep, um, not to ruffle any feathers and, you know, to not alarm the seller or the buyer, I provided the information to the agent because it was a rather large transaction um, and said, go back to your current title company and provide them with this information. And so they were able to get it closed. Um, and resolved. But um, if y'all, even if you're not closing a transaction with me, um, which I hope that's few and far between, um, if you have any questions regarding, you know, title work, or you feel like you're not getting um, the answers you need, always feel free to give me a call or shoot me an email, and I'll be happy to take a look at this, um, you know, and run scenarios by our underwriters. So. Um, we're always happy to help. And, you know, even if it doesn't close with me, if it can save your deal, then at the end of the day, that's all that matters, right? Your clients are taken care of. Um, and, you know, uh, you were able to uh, make a sale. So um, does anyone have any questions regarding anything on Schedule C? Okay. So we will so schedule D um, basically is uh, just all of the disclosures of who's involved um, in the transaction. So there's really nothing you need to um pay attention to on here to be honest with you it's just you know talks about the underwriters talks about all the officers um for the company um and uh in this particular case you'll see kensington vanguard which they are um part of the jv of momentous title um and Every title company's Schedule D is going to look just like this. It's going to have all the officers and, and company information there. Um, it's also going to reflect um, the endorsements. Since this particular file has not closed and we have not, you know, balanced or anything or, or actually come close to it yet, um, some of this information is blank, but you typically will see um, the endorsements that are on the policies, as well as um, the title premium and title evidence. So um, that is what Schedule D is. So this is just in case, this is an arbitration. Um, provision here, uh, just in case, you know, arbitration is required. Um, knock on wood, I don't think that it will ever have to go to that. Um, in my 23 years, I don't ever recall it, it, it going that far. So, um, privacy policy, again, nothing, it's just kind of a formality. It's just a standard document that has to be included. Um, let's see. What is the title defect and what? Sorry. 
Well, my apologies. My screen seems to have a mind of its own over here. Um, so what is the title defect? What happens when there are um, title issues? And what are title objections? My apologies. Something is give me one second. My one of my screens is frozen, and the other one I can see you guys on. So give me one second. Okay, here we go. I seem to have worked out the technical difficulties. My apologies again. So um, a title defect is anything that can cause a title to be considered invalid or defective in some way. Okay. Um, some examples are invalid documents due to forgery, fraud, undue influence, duress, incompetency, incapacity, or impersonation. So uh, the failure of any person or entity to have authorized a transfer or conveyance, um, a document affecting title that is not properly executed, signed, witnessed, or notarized, or delivered, um, undisclosed or unrecorded easements, not otherwise apparent on the land, um, no right of access to the land, a document executed under a falsified, expired, or otherwise invalid power of attorney. Um, and kind of uh, along the lines of power of attorneys, if you have a client who um, will be acting on behalf of a family member when they're selling a home, um, always send that power of attorney uh, to me um, and let me get that approved ahead of time. Because a lot of times, um, depending on the type of attorney that prepared the power of attorney, they may not cover everything that's needed. So I've, I mean, I would say about 50% of the time the power of attorneys were rejected by our underwriter and we got our in-house attorney to prepare another one specific to the transaction. So. Um, and so continuing on, a document that is not properly filed, recorded, or indexed in the public records, um, ownership claims by undisclosed or missing heirs. Um, I'm actually, I actually have a file right now. Another Briggs agent has um, a listing where the current owner uh, received it via an airship, but the prior title company who handled the transaction um, did not properly disclose and have all of the heirs sign off on the property. So we're working through those issues right now. Um, in addition, defects arising from an improper uh, prior foreclosure. Um, Undisclosed restrictive covenants affecting the property. Um, lien issues um, can also cause title defects. So, um, one second. So some examples of the lien issues are any statutory or constitutional contractors, mechanics or material men's lien for labor or materials uh, that began on or before the policy date. So talk to an attorney about your rights. Uh, lien for labor or materials furnished by a contractor without consent. Um, a previous owner failed to pay a mortgage. Uh, also known as a deed of trust, um, a judgment, tax, or special assessment, 
um, or a charge by your homeowners or condo association. So other liens or claims that may exist against the title um, that are not listed on the policy. So notify your title company immediately if someone files a lien or claims an interest on your property, failure to do so could jeopardize your claim. So, um, and contact the underwriter listed on the policy and follow their claim procedures. So, um, this has actually happened with, um, I've heard uh, in the DFW area, a few of the smaller uh, builders have not been paying all of their subcontractors, um, particularly one in Parker County in the Weatherford area. Uh, apparently there was a huge dispute with um, their lumber supplier. So after the buyers closed on the property, have been moved in, the lumber company went and not only filed a lawsuit against the builder, but also filed judgments against all of those properties. So that's been an ongoing um, saga for about a year and a half now. So um, that could very well happen. Um, and if your clients do need to file um, a claim, then that information will be on the title policy they receive um, after closing. And typically those are delivered uh, generally about four to six weeks after closing. Um, Texas Department of Insurance allows up to 90 days after closing for a title company to issue the policy, but typically it's about half that time frame. So, um, so what happens when there are title issues? The buyer has the right to make objections under Section 6D of the contract if there are items in Schedule B that they want cured or do not work with their intended use, i.e. building um, a pool or adding an addition to the house. Um, the seller has an opportunity to cure. So um, one one. One objection that I did run into um, actually last year um, when I was at my prior title company is the backyard. So it was in, the property was in the city of Dallas. There was an alley in the back. Um, and that's where they entered, you know, the, the driveway and the garage was in the back as well. Um, and of course, the trash and recycle was collected from the alleyway. But this particular house had, was built, I believe, in the early 70s. And the fence was almost, I think it was about 8 to 12 inches outside of the boundary line of the property line, um, according to the survey. And it had been that way since, you know, the house was built but the buyers objected and wanted it fixed. And so the seller ended up taking down the fence and having it redone. Of course, they had to alter some of their landscaping in the back, but um, things like that do happen. So, um, and again, if you, you know, have any questions regarding surveys or anything like that, um, or do you notice anything that's uh, questionable, just kind of run it by me. Um, I'll be happy to take a look at it and also get our, you know, underwriter's opinion about it as well. So um, what are title objections? Basically, the buyer objects to an item and asks the seller to cure that item. Um, sellers can try to cure, but they are not required to. So, um, you know, if you, you know, run into this situation again, you know, contact myself, um, contact Zareen as well, and we'll, you know, see what their options are and, and work through it. Okay. Title insurance FAQs. How long does a policy last? 
So most policies last as long as you or any heirs retain ownership interest. Um, does a policy need to be renewed? The policy does not need to be renewed, but coverage can be added after a policy is purchased. Um, who has the right to choose the title company, buyer or seller? So section nine of the Real Estate Settlement Procedures Act, RESPA, um, prohibits sellers from conditioning the home on the use of a specific insurance company. Um, is insurance required in Texas? No, it is not required. However, most lenders will require a title policy. Um, loan policies will cover the amount of the loan and remain in effect until you repay the loan. Um, also, in addition, you will not, these are very, very rare, but if you do, um, I will be surprised. So most title companies, 99.99999, percent of title companies will not close a transaction unless they issue a title policy. There's way too much liability to close without one. Um, there is one particular title company down in Ellis County that will do it, um, but they're, uh, they're a title company slash law firm. So, um, you know, and there's by not, usually if, they don't want to close with a title policy, um, then that means that there are uh, severe issues with the chain of title. So um, if I refinance, do I have to pay for a whole new policy? Um, no, you do. If you refinance, you do not need to get a new owner's policy because the owner's policy sticks with you until, you know, you don't own the property anymore. So, you know, sell it and or, or whatever the case may be. Um, you do, however, are required to get a new loan policy, um, which you can get a discount. And the discount varies based on the numbers you've had your current loan. So um, my experience with that, um, the, within the first three years, you get a 50% discount on your uh, base title premium. And then between years three and six, it falls to 25%. And that discount is called an R, the letter R and the number eight. So it's called an R8 credit. And so that is something we always issue um, if it's available. So if they, if they have, um, if the last loan of record was outside seven years, then there will be no discount. Um, if my home increases in value, am I still covered? You are still covered for the value of your policy. Um, if you add improvements to your home or if your home increases in value over time, you can buy an increased value endorsement to cover the increase in your property's value. Um, similar to your homeowner's insurance, right? You, if you bought your house and, you know, for example, my parents purchased the, the current house they live in, they purchased it in 1992. Um, you know, similar to your homeowner's insurance, you're, you need to increase the, um, you increase your homeowner's insurance based off of your value because, you know, if a tornado comes through, you know, you want to make sure you're coveraged for today's value. So similar, very, very, very similar when it comes to your, um, your title insurance policy. Um, if there's a significant increase in the value. Okay, so that pretty much concludes our ABCs of title insurance. I hope I was not too boring for y'all. <laughs> um, do any of y'all have any questions about any of the material that we've covered today? No? Okay. Um, then I am going to leave the um, Venmo QR code up um, for the next several minutes. So y'all are welcome to uh, get that taken care of if you haven't already done so. 
Um, please reference your name and license number in the payment memo, um, as well as in the Zoom chat. Um, and then again, if you have any questions, y'all can always feel free to reach out to me or Zareen. Um, we're always here to help. So, um, and even, uh, even I know our business hours are Monday through Friday, but if you have any questions, um, you know, on the weekends and a question comes up, you know, you're welcome to give me a call or, you know, shoot me a text. So um, we're, we're all in the real estate field. So I don't know that, you know, we're ever truly off, you know, it's kind of a 24 seven, um, 20, 24 seven field that we're in. So. <laughs> well, we're glad you're with it, with us in it. So. Absolutely. And 